The Cube at IBM Impact 2014 is brought to you by headline sponsor IBM. Here are your hosts, John Furrier and Paul Gillen. Okay, welcome back everyone. This is Silicon Angles, The Cube, our flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the city from the noise. I'm John Furrier, founder of Silicon Angle. I'm joined by my co-host Paul Gillen of Silicon Angle. Um, we're live in Las Vegas for IBM Impact and our next guest here to break down and the analysis is Maribel Lopez from Lopez Research. Maribel, welcome to The Cube. Thank you, happy first, to be here. First time on The Cube, great to have you on. We've seen each other at a lot of the events uh, around, around mobile, cloud, social for the past few years. Uh, a lot's happening, so first I got to ask you, what's your take of, of um, the cloud, mobile, social tsunami trend and IBM's role in that here at Impact? Yeah, so first of all, those used to be discrete trends if you go back a year or two ago, it was very silent. Everybody talked about mobile, everybody talked about cloud, uh, big data wasn't really on the thing yet. Now they're all coming together, so I think one of the real challenges I talk to organizations about is the fact that they're coming together. So it's good that IBM is actually trying to put out some thought leadership and vision around what that transition looks like. What are you seeing in the market right now? I know you're writing a book, we'll get to that in a second. We were talking before you yeah. came on about some of the trends you're tracking. And data is obviously the key value proposition. Analytics is changing the game at many levels, but mobile in particular. Um, what, what's your take on what's happening in the market right now? Yeah, so we've done lots of surveys over this, so we've actually been watching people as they progress through this, and they started out talking about BYOD, you know, and then it became BYOA, BYOS. Uh, what we see now is everybody's accepted that mobile is a hot topic. It's the number two topic behind big data and analytics in terms of um, IT leaders' concerns, right? And the difference between those two is uh, big data and analytics is number one. They're not really spending the money on it yet because they don't know what to do. Uh, mobilizing the business is number two and they're really finally starting to spend some money on it. We have, and what does that mean? What does spending money mean? Uh, it means that this year, 74% uh, of the companies we interviewed said that they would be mobile enabling five or more applications. So if you go back a year and a half ago, people were doing BYOD, people were doing corporate libel, it was really BlackBerry 3.0 just email and calendar. Now we're talking about mobile enabling workflows. So it's a big, big shift, I think, in the industry. And a pretty time compressed shift going from last year still being about BYOD, email and calendar, this year being all about mobile apps, so. Well, let me tell you what I hear from a lot of B2B companies, though. They, they say, well, we don't really need a mobile strategy because we already know who all our customers are. They're, they're not, they're using the phone, they use their desktop computers. We don't need to, to have a mobile strategy. What do you say to them? Oh, if if you don't have a mobile strategy in this day and age, you're going to get buried. And I think the problem with people's mobile strategy is they think of it exactly as that. It's a mobile strategy. It's this other thing that we do over there, right? Um, mobile really is the business, and the business is mobile. It's like saying you're not going to have a mobile strategy, you're not going to have a cloud strategy. If you don't have either of these, you're fundamentally not going to be able to operate in the new world. And I think the challenge around that is people haven't really grappled with the fact that mobile and cloud change our business processes. They change uh, what we connect, how we connect, how we engage and transact. And that's a big, scary deal for people. And that's why they don't want to have a mobile strategy, because it means they have to really think about changing business processes. What they think of mobile strategies being, well, I'll have an HTML5 enabled website, and so that's my mobile strategy. Yeah. I think you're thinking of it much more, uh, much more in terms of transformational uh, perspective, uh, that changes the way you do business. How does it change the way you do business? Yeah. Um, let, let's pick up for a second on this concept of is HTML5 enough, right? So I, I think where people start the dialogue is, I don't know what to do because it's so complicated. And then they come up with, well, I'll just sprinkle some HTML5 pixie dust on it and it'll all be fine, right? Um, what I mean by changing business processes is it's, what do people do when they're sitting at a laptop versus what do they do when they're on the go, right? Um, what's the essence of what they're trying to complete? And that's the change because we've got these applications that are great, they're fully featured, they're bloated, they're unusable. You're not going to sit here and do eight clicks on a device. That's not mobile enabled. That just means you took something that was on this and you moved it to something like that. Uh, so that's probably the first change is just trying to figure out what people want to do. And you got to throw out a lot of baby with the bathwater to get there. You know? 
a lot of years of code. <laughs> well, uh, let me uh, uh, sort of build on that. Something John Warnock said uh, uh, was quoted as saying last year that that apps are not a solution. Apps, apps are not a solution to anything. They're just a they're a way station on the way to fully to, to, to mobile enabled uh, 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 interaction so that you don't need an app, you, that apps are artificial. Yeah. Do you agree with that or are, are apps, are we going to look back 10 years from now and say apps were stupid? No, I think um, if there's one thing I've learned in the past 10 years, it's that nothing's stupid and nothing goes away. <laughs> I think what happens is it's a degree of everything. I will admit we are a bit app happy at the moment. Um, Particularly on the consumer side, you know, the concept of the micro app has really taken hold. Listen, you need apps, but if you approach the problem to say, I need a mobile app, you've kind of lost the battle before you've even begun. You don't know what you're trying to do, so you can't make a decision about should this be HTML5, should this be an app, how much of whatever this thing it should be is. So. And it's different context too. I mean, I talk to folks all the time, mobile apps are different than having a web response, web responsive right. app. Meaning, yeah. it's on web and mobile versus a pure mobile app. Yeah. Which could get you ahead of your skis. I mean, I've heard people say, hey, I built a mobile app, I launched it, people downloaded, then we had <laughs> then iteration, yeah. Yeah. and people didn't, weren't downloading the updates. But a lot yeah. of mobile yeah. apps just enable you to do something that you should be able to do on the website anyway. Right, and, and this gets into what's different about mobile, right? Which is exactly where you're going with that. What's, what's special about it? What makes it that you need a mobile app, right? Uh, things like location, things like voice browsing, things like taking a, an image. And people think of uh, image and voice and all this stuff only in B2C. It's highly applicable in B2B as well, right? So if, if you are out as an insurance adjuster taking photos of that, those claims, if you are a field service person trying to take images of uh, what water heater you've installed to keep into the record system for CRM. So there's a lot of contextual elements that mobility provides, and that's the real change. And that's what mobile enablement is. It's not the decision of, um, I need an app. It's because the, the reality is you need HTML5, you need hybrid, and you need native, right? It's, it's all of the above. So it's a matter of what the balance is. And the balance can only be determined by understanding what you're trying to build. So what's your biggest uh, advice to the folks out there, um, and potentially IBM customers here? I mean, uh, well, let me, let, me, let me back up. Let's first analyze the IBM situation. Yeah. Um, mobile's obviously a big part of them now. <laughs> we were talking on the intro. Yeah. Um, what's your take on it? Meat on the bone, you know, looking good off the tee, middle of the fairway. How would you classify the, uh, the current mobile? Yeah, okay. <laughs> and this is I don't want to lead you into uh, <laughs> no, it's sort of, in the hole, you know? No, game it's over. sort of hard. I, I say they're in the middle of the fairway now, but it's a long way till the end of the golf game. And let me explain what I mean by that. I really applaud the fact that mobile didn't have a vision, right? There's a lot of companies that were doing piece parts of it. IBM decided to stand up and say, hey, listen, this is everything you need in mobile, and this is the big mobile first chart. But you know, when they rolled out that vision, there wasn't a lot there there, right? Now we're at the point where they've made a ton of acquisitions to fill in the little, you know, there's something in each of the blocks now, right? So, first of all, A, they need a vision, the industry needs a vision, they have one. B, they're starting to execute on that vision, so that kind of puts them in into that fairway, but it's a lot of acquisitions. It's a lot of stuff to integrate. It's a lot of stuff to keep momentum on at the same time, right? So there's always been that concept, if a big company buys a small company, do you still get that benefit of that innovative spirit and the next level of things? And we really need to get to the next level in mobile. We're, we're not there yet. So no matter who you are, we're not there yet. You know, I always compare and contrast the um, early adopters who were driving pioneering change right. to the Larry Ellison of the world, to my spectrum, <laughs> right? Yeah. Ah, cloud's stupid, who needs, no one works in the cloud business, you know, yeah. and they're doing, they're great. That's what, that's what Oracle does. They see a trend, they get on it, it's all, all speed ahead, and then the he whole called, shift He gets called it time sharing. Yeah, he <laughs> just, he gets, it, but he executes. He puts wood behind the arrow, and it's like we're doing it, and people live or die based on how well they do on that. But so IBM seems to be in that kind of mode where I won't say fast follower, but like they weren't, lead, they're not leading the DevOps world certainly. However, they have all the right packages together, so they still got a lot to do. So, but IBM is that like an oracle where they have such big customers that 
and they'll get there in my opinion. But the question is, where are they on that on that on that spectrum? In your tank, from Blue Mix to DevOps to mobile, being a real supplier to the customers. I think they're at phase two um, of what's probably or, or inning two of what's you know a long baseball game for for lack of a better word. Uh, they have assembled a bunch of the pieces. They're just now starting to integrate. I mean, this is the first uh, conference where they really had the integration story come out. Right. So last year it was. Um, a slide with a bunch of logos on it, and it was just the mobile stuff, and it didn't connect to the cloud stuff. So this year, we've got mobile and cloud and analytics connecting loosely. Uh, we've stood up some serious cloud services around mobile, but you know, make make no bones about it. It's a it's a highly iterative time. So they're they're at the beginning of this process. Um, I will say, you know, I, I try to compare them to some other companies to sort of give some frame of reference, right? Uh, because they're big, they're bigger than a lot of the other people we're, we speak about, right? So, you know, SAP, another uh, great example. They were focused on mobile, then they defocused a little. They've got this cloud, big data analytics thing all going at the same time. Uh, they don't have as much in the DevOps space. Uh, you know, this is this is a clash of the titans kind of game right now. So, what was startup heaven last year is now. Big boys, right? CAs in it, G's in it, SAPs in it. Everybody's got their own version of how this is rolling down. So I think it's a chaotic time. I mean, they're in there, but we no one's run away with the vision yet. So we've been, and we've we've both been on analyst um, meetings with SAP and others, where they've laid out their mobile thing. Mobile developers, like developers are a big part of the whole mobile equation. Right. And there's been some right. misfires from other vendors. Where where is IBM with the developer side of it? You don't, you don't see the major development kits, but you see development friendly uh, activities going on here. Um, do they have a mobile developer mind share or is it on their agenda? What's your assessment of that? Uh, it's on the agenda. I wouldn't say they have a mobile developer mind share, but I mean truly, I don't think anybody has a mobile developer mind share right now. I mean, I think there were some logical candidates for that that haven't happened yet. You know, Microsoft strikes you as a logical candidate. But they've got other issues, right, in terms of where their mobile operating systems and, and other things, next PC generation operating system has gone. Before Paul gets to his question, I know he wants this question, there's a question from the crowd chat here. Tim Crawford uh, asks, how should organizations change their thinking about mobile and apps then? How should they change their yeah. thinking about mobile yeah. and apps then? How can IBM help change organizations' thinking around mobile beyond tech apps? And what should orgs do to change their thinking around mobile and apps? Yeah, I think this concept of um, the composable business that they rolled out, which is sort of the next evolution of you know, service-oriented architecture and object-oriented programming only taken from a business level, is a really good way of thinking about it. Um, the, the thing that I see as different is, in yesterday's world, you built an app, you stood it up, it was done for a year, maybe two years, maybe more. Maybe you threw more functionality onto it. Um, in this world, your app's never done, right? So the best thing you can do if you're thinking of yourself as a business is to act like Google and think it's always a beta, right? Every six weeks, every 12 weeks, every you know nine months, something major has to be happening or you're going to fall behind. Google's a lot of failed products under their belt too as well. So Larry Page in an interview, just said that the vision of Google is to build apps that people can't live without. Right. So that's kind of their guiding principle now, if you look yeah. at some of the misfires now that he's taking over the helm. So in a way, that the apps for enterprises should think the same way, don't you agree? They should. I, I would say there's one difference between the way Google does it and the way enterprises should do it, and that's that Google's great at coming up with ideas and throwing them against the wall and you know, sort of seeing if they stick. They're not really good at productizing anything, and this is where I think the rigor of IT can come in and, and is still valuable. The concept that there is a process and that you are always advancing and that there is a feedback loop. Um, so, I, you know, I'm not saying there isn't a feedback loop in Google, but I think the real difference is for businesses, you have to be fast and you have to always be iterating and think it's not done. Um, right now, they desperately want it to just be done and they desperately want it to just need to only be done one way with one set of tools, which is not the reality of the universe right now. 
So, I was a loyal, was a loyal user of Google Reader for many years. I'm not always crazy about the way they pull the plug on, on, on the product. <laughs> well, that too. Uh, Google thinking right of, the of the next generation beyond mobile, you know, we think now of mobile very much as the as the device, as the phone, as the the tablet. But but of course we have this whole tsunami of wearable and and right. and uh, embedded sensors in in trucks, in you know, in trains and whatever coming along. Uh, how should companies be prepared for the next wave of mobile when it goes beyond the the handheld device? Yes, yeah, so I think. Even the word mobile is kind of dead in a way, right? Because what we're really talking about is just connected devices, big ones, small ones, and then it's just what kind of software stack you can run on those and what kind of sensor data they, they feed you. So I think the, the first thing you have to think about is how are you going to collect all that data, which gets us into big data and analytics? Um, how are you going to inject that data into business processes? Because right now, you know, your basic business process doesn't even have something as simple as location in it, let alone that you move, that your temperature is X, right? So there's all these um, motion, uh, environmental conditions, all these new data points you can build into your applications that I think are really critical. And you know, I call this, um, I've got a book coming out in October on what I call right time experiences. It's giving people the right information on the right device at the right moment, right? So that that's a big difference from what we do today because that assumes that you can switch up what that is. Because right now you design an app, it gives you X. Well, if I happen to need Y, that app's going to have to adapt to me at some point and give me Y when I need it. So I saw a uh, survey came out a couple weeks ago that said, uh, I think it was a Pew Research survey, said 90% of of uh, online Americans don't trust marketers and sales organizations with their private data. A lot of these applications we're talking about are delivering data at the right time in the right place, rely upon having private data about right. you. Is that is that a, a big hurdle for companies to overcome in really taking advantage of real-time data? Yeah, it's a <laughs> It's a huge hurdle, but it's largely a hurdle of the way we've implemented it, right? So everybody thinks that the killer contextual app for mobile is that I can give you the right ad. And it's like, okay, um, that's great, but is that really value to me? Well, it assumes you want the ad. Yeah, it assumes you want the ad. You know, maybe I want information that says the store is closing early today. That's more valuable to me, right? So this is why getting people the right relevant information, which is an analytics problem, by the way, and a complex event processing problem, uh, we're not there yet where people are really giving you something valuable, which is why it's annoying and why it's a privacy concern. So there's a bit of a chicken and an egg here. Um, there's also who they trust. They trust new world companies for some reason more than old world companies. You know, AT&T can't do the same things that Facebook can. It's just the reality. Part of it is what you pay for, right? I get this extra value, but I didn't pay for it. So it's like, okay, I've done an idea exchange. Um, that whole data is the new oil thing. Consumers will wise up to the fact that their data is valuable. And I think we've got a whole new marketplace opportunity that's around how we deal with data. And, and uh, of course your relationship with the company defines the value that you get from mobility. So if, if, uh, if an app can tell me where the closest free Wi-Fi signal is, that has value to me, even though that provider may be a company that is, uh, is an old line company. Right. right. So it's more about fulfilling needs than, than, than uh, uh, reinforcing brand. And, and we're not, I, I think part of the problem with needs is there's needs that give you money and needs that don't. So it's balancing that so that you get money but that you're also giving people value with things that they don't necessarily have to pay for. Meryl, let's talk about what you're working on right now. You mentioned the book, Right Time Experiences. Share with us some of them. Um, you're writing a new book. You're at ahead of the curve. You've always been ahead of the curve. So share with us, give us, some, tease us a little bit on some of the, the breadcrumbs around some of your work around this right time, right place, because that's about real-time analytics, it's about using data, personalization, I can only imagine the book, So, but I haven't read, heard anything about it, so share. Right, okay, so the first thing is that people are going to phase into mobility through extend, enhance, transform, right? Extending is just putting your stuff on the devices, we're doing that now. Um, enhancing is where we start getting into what I talked about, about this, how do you incorporate data into the business processes? How do you incorporate uh, location, time of day? Uh, you start to use some analytics. You get analytics even in your app so that you know what's going wrong, right? The transform phase, you're just doing different things than you've done before. Tesco, a train station in, in Korea, things like um, what Square was showing today on stage, or Uber being able to give you, you know, the taxi right when you need it using location and ease of payment, right? This is just changing the experience from what we have today, and we're starting to see some early examples of people making that transition. But what is really important is 
you have to figure out how to mobile enable the business, so that means a couple of different style of development models. You have to figure out what kind of databases you want to have and what kind of analytics you want to have on top of that. And then you got to have a cloud versus on-prem mix. A lot of people are struggling right now with, I got data locked in my back-end systems on-prem. That's not very cloud-friendly. How do I do that? So Right Time Experiences is um, the thinking about the processes differently and building an architectural strategy to make that happen. How about use of internal mobility? Uh, is yeah. this the story that's not being told, really, how companies can enable their salespeople to deliver personalized quotes on the spot or deliver the latest collateral uh, constantly to their iPad? Is, is, that, is that sort of the, the untold story of mobility now? I, I think that's what ends up paying for mobility at the end of the day, right? We've got some massive efficiency gains that just right out of the gate, um, I call these the quick wins. These are the paper replacement apps. These are the quicker time to cash apps, right? And those are the things that enterprises are looking at and saying, uh, that's a reason for me to go mobile because if I just give you the HR app on a mobile device, that hasn't really bought me anything or got me anything different than what I have today, right? If you can, uh, you know, DocuSign worked with Comcast and tablets. Comcast is now signing their deals two days faster than they used to, right? It's a big deal, right? You send somebody a contract right there, they sign it, they're done, right? This is the type of efficiency we need. Okay. Uh, any final words you want to share with the audience about why impact so important? Name of the book again? Right Time Experiences. Right Time Experiences. So it didn't say mobile in the title. No, because it's about mobile, big data, and analytics. It's about them all coming together. And is there any right-sizing involved in this? <laughs> I had to get that in there. Oh, <laughs> Couldn't resist. No. Oh, come on, I know, I'm an IT geek sometimes. Oh, no, right-sizing, no. right-time experiences. <laughs> Real-time is great. So share with the folks out there, final comment, I'll give you the final word. Share with the folks out there, why is impact so important right now for IBM and their customers? What, what are the key things and what does IBM have to do to be successful? Uh, impact's important because People really need to get to the next level of what their dev and cloud strategy is, right? We've been thinking about it as efficiencies. Uh, we've been thinking about it as replicating the things that we've done in the past. There are actually customers here that are talking about how they're changing their business by using mobile and cloud. And they have real hard examples of changing the customer experience, changing the revenue model, and people desperately need vision, right? They need to see that somebody's done it, that it works, and that they can do it too. And that's what I think Impact is about. Maribel Lopez, thanks for coming on theCUBE. I'd like to spend more time with you. We should Thank definitely you. do another segment. One thing that we didn't get to that I wanted to touch upon, maybe we could follow up at another time, is culture. There's oh, a lot sure. of cultural change going yeah, on definitely. around this major waves of innovation. This is theCUBE, we'll be right back. Our culture is more guests, more guests, <laughs> more guests. Two days of live coverage, we'll be right back after this short break.